my name is Dan Rosanova. I want to talk today a little bit about uh, the other things in Azure. So it's odd that this is the first session because this is going to be not very a biz talk session. But you know, I, I left doing biz talk, but uh, you can leave biz talk, but biz talk never leaves you. Um, so I still do a lot of biz talk like stuff, and uh, I wanted to walk through some of the the things that I've seen that I thought BizTalk was really useful for uh, that I feel are sort of missing sometimes. So what is code-based orchestration, right? Uh, uh, the funniest part is this sentence. The, the thing that me makes the most sense is probably the word cloud on there, like the rest of it. So code-based orchestration is really, you're talking Visual Studio-based, your C-sharp experience. Um, it's using production features of Azure, um, and it's scalable. And we'll talk about scale at the end. Uh, but these are sort of the, the, the driving forces behind this. Um, and really, before we get too much further, because there's a lot of cool stuff you're going to see today not from this. This is a very community-focused uh, uh, talk and framework and things like that. Uh, so code-based orchestration, though, is, is not going to be for your finance department. Um, it's not going to be for your web designer. It's not going to be for the person in your call center. Um, it's not going to be for the goofy intern that you hire this summer. Um, it's going to be for programmers. Okay, so it's going to be for people who want to write code, for people who live in Visual Studio. Uh, so how, how we're approaching that, and this is something that's actually used within Microsoft, is with the Durable Task Framework. So the Durable Task Framework was open source last year. It's an uh, a eventual consistency um, framework to, to write workflows on, code-based workflows. Uh, I think it's actually really interesting because it does a lot of the same types of things that the orchestration engine provides for us uh, on BizTalk, but it does them in a little bit of a different way. Um, and so if we look at what we're talking about, like what is a workflow fundamentally, or an orchestration, uh, if you get away from the, the high level stuff in it, uh, it's really about three things, right? It's about durability, so you know that things are done or not done. Uh, it's about scalability, so you know that uh, you can keep scaling out. You can have things that last a long time. You know, that's another tenet of that durability part. And it's about reliability. So knowing that stuff that's done is done, so, or stuff that's not done is rolled back. So about consistency. Uh, if you put these things together, though, what you get is eventual consistency. And if you do any work with cloud computing, this should be a term that resonates with you. Um, it does at Microsoft, all over Microsoft, um, although I will admit before coming to Microsoft the first place I had heard of it was from the other side of Lake Washington, uh, where there's another cloud company, or so they tell me. Um, but it's a big driving force that they use. So you know, this is important stuff. Uh, so what does this all mean? What do these three things give you? What is this eventual consistency about? It's about what your workflow did and what it's going to do. So that's what you have to keep in mind here. Like, what is the work that's got to be done and uh, how far in that work have you, have you made it? Uh, so what this really comes down to is separating out logic into one piece, state into another, and runtime into yet another. Um, this is actually something the orchestration engine does really well, and I'll talk more about the parallels in a little bit. But when we look at par parallel task framework, a durable task framework, what we get is that the orchestration and task is code that you're writing. Um, so your logic is living on one side. Uh, state management is happening within the cloud, is happening in service bus, really, and some logging into storage. And then uh, it's really a bring your own compute model. So you pick how you want this to run. This is where we're going to change from the model that, uh, that the orchestration engine gives us, which is you know the compute model is within BizTalk. Here's where this is going to start to look a little bit more familiar. I had a Marco Rubio moment there for a second, if anyone remembers that. Um, Here's where we're going to start to look a little bit more like the orchestration engine. Uh, what do you get from workflow that's useful? Why do people want workflow? This is a, this is a trend that hasn't gone away. People keep trying to build BPM type stuff. Um, and because you get really valuable things. So error handling and compensation, that should sound really f familiar for anyone that's done orchestration. Uh, versioning. Versioning is a really important aspect of making workflows. Um, if you've ever worked on a uh, a BPM product that didn't have versioning, you'll know what the pain of that is. I've worked on a few in my past. Uh, things like automatic retries. These are durable timers, another one. So being able to set a timer and know that the timer's going to come true, even if there's a restart or a, a movement of where the execution is happening. Um, the ability to interact with external events and to get really good diagnostics. Uh, these are actually all things that the orchestration engine gives you really well, um, things that I miss uh, when I'm not working with the orchestration engine. 
Uh, but these are things that we can also get from the durable task framework. And it's not to say that these do the same things and they work in different ways, uh, but they're fundamentally providing the same underlying constructs if you don't have the luxury of working with the orchestration engine. So let's look at a common use case, right? What, until we get in, in something concrete, it's kind of hard to see what this really means and what it all is. Customer onboarding is a really good common use case. I actually stole this from, I think, chapter 14 in my book, the last chapter in my book. I made it through my, almost my whole biz talk book without talking about orchestration. And that's not because I don't like orchestration. I really do. But unless you understand how the messaging is working in biz talk, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's just sort of putting this you know, uh, veneer on top of something and, and making it look pointy clicky. Um, but underneath it, it's really powerful. And so when you look at a customer onboarding scenario, this is going to be a pretty typical convoy, like a parallel convoy. You've got some things that have to happen in parallel. Uh, address verification would be a common one. Uh, bank account or credit card account verification. Uh, a bank account verification actually in the US has gotten a lot more sophisticated in the last few years. They actually use like transactions to verify accounts now, rather than you just typing in a number. So they know that they got the right account. <clears throat> and then uh, credit, credit checks. So that's pretty common everywhere. So what would this look like in orchestration, right? It would look like this. Um, which actually, I love this because this is a, like an anti-pattern for orchestration. I always was frustrated when I saw people just put expression shapes inside of an orchestration. It was like, well, why'd you even use the orchestration? Um, if you knew what you were doing, it was really smart. You could get some really cool stuff like that you don't even realize that the orchestration engine will do retry for you in state management, uh, but it does. Uh, so this should look pretty familiar. Here's my Simpsons reference for the day. Um, like if you've, if you've done workflow, you know, it's going to be like this. So let's do the little test drive on this. Um, unfortunately, no, that's not my car. But this was my vacation. Uh, so what does this look like? The same workflow. If you look at it in Visual Studio, using a durable task framework, you pull it in, it's a NuGet package, and all you do is define a class that's using a base class of uh, a task orchestration. And so this is pure Visual Studio experience. You can see how easy this is. The actual workflow itself, when it's, it's starting up, I've got an activity client. I've got a context. Context lets me do things like write out my tracing. So that would be the equivalent of tracing. And you could see there that I was just doing a simple await. So like this is really simple code, right? There's nothing really fancy here. Actually, to go back on that one, let's see, replay this. Uh, this is like as, as plain vanilla as it gets. So here. You can see this result, await, no. task, when all. Uh, so this is really cool code, right? This doesn't look very uh, obtrusive. It's not getting in your way. It's a lightweight framework. Uh, await is a really cool feature. The, the async features of .NET 4.5 are really amazing. But if you don't do them with something like the durable task framework, and you're calling external services or crossing a process boundary, there's a high likelihood at some point you're going to be awaiting for Godot. Like something's going to go wrong, and the process isn't going to return, and you're just going to be sit there waiting for something to come back that never comes back. Uh, when I did a lot of distributed computing in the past, that was like the, the point you'd come back into the lab, like doing supercomputer computing, and cry because your job that had been running for a week just died because one task didn't return, and all the research you'd gotten and the time on the machine is gone. Um, so you know, this is, again, it's not getting in your way, but it's providing you some cool stuff. Like you can append status. I mean, this shouldn't look too crazy. This is just core vanilla .NET stuff. Um, and to start off workflow, it's just this line on the bottom, actually. It's... Let's look at what this actually looks like running, though, because uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, there's a, a code sample that you'll see at the end of this uh, that you can download. It's BizTalk samples. Um, and this is just a, a console application shim for the durable task framework, just so you can see what it's like working. It's got some help commands that help you see what's going on there. And here, when we start up a uh, orchestration instance, I'm just going to do S for start, give it the name of the orchestration, uh, put in an instance ID. I just want that for myself. Um, and then a, a set of parameters, so like a customer name, an account number, and the number of credit agencies I want to score this against and hit start, and this worker is starting up. Again, this is just host is hosted in this console application, so nothing special. Um, and you'll see in a second as this fires up, uh, those traces are writing out, so they're color coded. I guess it's kind of hard on this screen to see what some of those are. Uh, but you can see that stuff is starting and ending, because that's the traces that were written in there. Um, and then after a while, you see that this kind of just sits here and processes its way through. So this is pretty cool. 
Um, it's giving us some useful stuff. Uh, more useful, however, is that I can do things like uh, do a diagnostics command on this or monitoring command, and I can uh, dump out the history of what's happened. So even though it didn't look like it, that code was all using service bus. So there's a connection string in the config. It's using that. It's using features that I talked about on Integration Mondays two weeks ago, features I didn't know about in Service Bus until I worked on the team, um, things like uh, sessions. And then here, I can actually see this state from that workflow. And you know, you saw that I stopped this program. So all state in the program went away. But I can see the history that this workflow had run. Um, and I can actually go and see that it was rejected, like that was its final result. And if I paste back in these IDs, I can go get some detailed history about this. So this is going to be like a kind of like what you would put in your trace, <laughs> diagnostics trace stuff. And I can see these uh, specific traces that I'm writing out. So I chose these. I'm putting them out there. Um, they're things that I wanted to see that mean something to me. But this is pretty cool, but it's nothing that's like earth shattering or crazy. Uh, but it's just good coding practice. Now we can see some more interesting stuff. So when something fails, because you know it always works on my laptop, right? Uh, except for the projector. Um, and then uh, doesn't work in production or has a problem in production. And it's when problems go wrong that you have problems. Here I'm doing something that's actually bad. I'm going to pass in really what's an invalid parameter uh, for this orchestration. And that's to say, don't do any uh, credit checks. And so it's going to start. It's not really going to say anything nasty to me, at least not at first. Um, I can see that two of these tasks are starting. So it's validating an address and the bank account. I can see that the validate, those two validations are complete, but that I can also see that nothing else is happening. And so this isn't what I expected. So this is, this is a problem, right? So I want to see, well, what's going on here? Well, what have I, what have I broken? You know, and, and, and how do I see you know, where, where the state of this thing is right now? So an easy way to do that is, again, I'm going to go back to that dump command. And I'm going to see, now I can see that there's a, an orchestration that's red. This one failed. And I can actually see what the, what the error was, but it doesn't really give me a lot of help. This is, uh, actually, this is a, what's the right way to phrase this? This is a, a situation you might find yourself in frequently with BizTalk if you're new to it, is something went wrong and how do I find where it went wrong? You know, and it can be very frustrating if you don't know how to do that. Um, and here, you can actually get a pretty easy way to do that. So if we look at, how do I play this? If we look at this playthrough now, I can actually see uh, another feature. Rather than dumping this out and seeing the status, I can actually do a replay. So this is a step beyond uh, what I did before, which is just looking at the status. Here I'm going to say, take these same two instance parameters uh, and replay that actual workflow from something, from another environment that I'm in. So again, this is another instance. This is a separate execution thread. Uh, like this program stopped and restarted. And here, when I type this in, uh, you can actually see it saying waiting for debugger, right? So that should be encouraging, right? What, what kind of debugger is this going to be? What sort of crazy custom thing is this? It's nothing crazy or custom. It's Visual Studio. So I just go in and I attach to a process. And you can see Camtasia running while I run that, while I record this. Um, and now, all of a sudden, I'm in Visual Studio. So like this is pretty cool. I like this part. You can see I've got my context. I've got all of the parameters that were set into this. Like this thing's already done. It already happened. This is historical. And I'm able to just replay this. Um, and I'll play out of this and continue. I know which tasks didn't work. I know the address check had told me in that history that it finished. So that was cool. Uh, the one I'm interested in is credit check. And so I need to uh, step through this a little bit and see what's going on. So I can see, OK, my for loop. And I realize I didn't actually run through that for loop, right? Something went wrong there. Um, and when I step through this next, I can actually see that, that that root orchestration, the thing that we started in the very beginning, actually gets an exception. And I can see what that exception is. I can see what the error was. I can see it's a divide by 0. I can see where in the code it was. And I can replay this as many times as I want. So this can be running in a cloud service, have this problem, and all I need is that tracking information to look at it and replay it somewhere else. So this is a capability that there are times in my BizTalk career I would have killed for, um, literally killed someone for. Uh, so come on. That's not impressive to anyone? 
Like, yeah, okay, yeah, there we go. That, that's, that's this guy right here. None of this is me. If you like what you're seeing, it's him. If you don't, uh, I'm just not explaining it well. Um, so how did this work, though, right? This is a bunch of magic. I'm just showing some command line stuff and waving my hands, and everything looks like magic. Um, there's actually quite a bit going on here that's, that's really cool from this framework. So for instance, you saw me do a git status earlier. Now I'm going to get history for that exact same orchestration instance. And you can see what this is. It's a bunch of messages. So this is a bunch of messages in a session. This is what this, this, this file actually comes from storage, but at runtime, this was messages in a session in service bus. That's how they're together. That's how they are a unit of execution. That's what ties them together. And you can see what all the state was every way through this. And so when the replay comes, like I didn't have to write. You saw the whole code for this. I didn't have to write any of this stuff. It's just there. And it's giving me this stuff for free. Uh, so that is a pretty cool aspect of this. It's my favorite feature of it. Um, but it's not the only one that's really cool. Here's another one. This tool, this uh, test example, actually has a, a simulator in it to make a bunch of stuff, a bunch of accounts. And here I'm starting a second worker in a second command line window. Um, and you'll see when I start this simulation that uh, both of these windows actually uh, start processing. And they're not talking to each other. They're just independently working through the same service bus connection string. Um, and what that gives me is some really good parallelization. But it also gives me really good durability. And I was harping on about durability earlier and why durability is so important. And again, it's something you do get from BizTalk with orchestration. Uh, that's, that's something I missed very much. But here you can see at the bottom window, I just control seed that right when it was doing validating bank account for eight. And I can see some other things above it, like, uh, like these credit checks and stuff, where there was stuff running in this window. I guess you can hardly see that. There was stuff running in this window, and I just unceremoniously killed it. I pulled the plug. Um, that would be the equivalent of like a VM restart or something. I don't know. Uh, not that that ever happens. Uh, and the processing then continues to happen on this, top, on this top thread. And I can see I'm looking for something for test account eight. And this thing's just whirling ahead, doing its other stuff. Uh, eight never came up on here. And what's going to happen here in just a second is that uh, the thread of execution from here that started actually restarts on this side because of that idea that you're using a session, because it's in service bus, because the clients are doing competing consumer and, and, and going ahead with that. And you can actually see test account five here being spit out. And then finally, in just a second, right when I'm about to get frustrated with this, um, test account eight comes out. Uh, so that was real durability and portability. So this will both scale and be durable as you scale. So like that's a, I mean, I know it doesn't look like too much in a command line window, but that's a really important uh, trait to have in the sort of processing that, that you want to do. Um, so really, I guess the next question is, uh, where can you get this, right? Uh, this is up on GitHub. Um, it was open source last year by the App Plat team. Um, it's actually used pretty extensively within Microsoft. This is how Microsoft, a lot of the Azure teams, actually deploy their services. Uh, because we're managing big stuff. We've got a lot of things that you need to have happen. Uh, you want that eventual consistency. Um, and it's a NuGet package. So when you start a project for this, you just pull in the NuGet package and you're set. Um, this is still, uh, still fairly new, but I mean, it's only new on NuGet. We've been using it internally for quite some time. I, I won't name which services use it, but you probably use services that use it. Uh, and so why am I here and why am I talking about this open source thing that seems to have, eh, I mean, a, a sort of loose attachment to, to BizTalk? Uh, it's because of this community. It's because of you guys make uh, BizTalk as, as strong and as popular as it is. And uh, we want to make sure that we're providing tools that you need you know, for, for a variety of, of things you're going to see when you get to the cloud. Some of those things, you'll see more exciting things later today, frankly, uh, that are solved with new tools. Um, and we've got some existing tools that you can use to solve other problems. You know, so it's a big ecosystem, and I really want some support from this community if we can. You know, there are tasks on here that haven't been done yet. There's documentation. It's all on GitHub. There's, uh, there are samples that you can contribute to or features. Um, some tooling would be really, really nice. The service bus team is really good at making and running a service. OK, well, I have your attention for still a second. Um, so Service Bus, what is that? It's event hubs, it's messaging, queues and topics, and it's relay. So these are the toys in the box. Play with whatever toys you want. Um, they're all fun. Come talk to me about any of them. Uh, and the last thing I kind of want to leave on was, uh, you know, so this was a surprise to me. 
to get to Microsoft and realize that a lot of people in Microsoft are a bit disconnected from some of the customers you serve. Uh, your customers are very on-prem heavy focused uh, customer base still at this time. Um, and you're probably still running into people who are pretty resistant about this cloud thing, um, scared about the cloud. Uh, but you know what I can say sitting, coming from your side of the audience a year ago, just under a year ago to this side, is that more and more companies are getting really comfortable with the cloud. And not just with the cloud, they're getting comfortable with Azure because we're building an enterprise cloud platform. So something that's made for you guys and your customers, not for startups that have no budget and really don't care if things fit. Um, and uh, I think the numbers for Service Bus will speak for themselves. So uh, last month, we hit a bit of a milestone. We did 500 billion messages and uh, events through Service Bus. So between event hubs and messaging. Um, yeah, that's not a typo. That's a B, a billion. That's my Austin Powers reference for you, Mike. Um, so in the time I've been standing up here and talking to you, that means there have been almost 500 million messages that went through Service Bus. So it's Monday morning. It's actually could be higher than that. So uh, you know, if you're if you're worried about scale, um, you need some pretty big scale before I'd be too worried. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>